okay so uh, very good evening to one and all to all the members of aip association of indian physicists i am sonali patnaik currently i am working as a postdoctoral researcher at national institute of science education and research nisa bhuvaneshwar and it's my immense privilege to start the meeting on behalf of association of indian physicists janardhan singh foundation whose motto is accelerating science and transcending to the scientific community and therefore so far we have tried to reach maximum students faculties researcher through our daily activities and today is the second talk of wip public lecture series wip is what's hot in physics and the objective of wip lecture series is to bring scientific awareness about recent and trending advancements in physics and the importance of scientific research and today we will be talking about aditya l1 which is india's first dedicated space observatory designed to study the sun and the indian space research organization isro launched the observatory class satellite on 2nd september 2023 using a pslv xl rocket the satellite is currently en route to the lagrangian 1 point and is expected to enter into a stable halo orbit around l1 by the first week of january 2024 and to have this exciting event today we have in between dr shrijit padinetri the one behind the aditya l1 mission the ground breaking mission after chandrayaan 3 again so to give a brief introduction about him dr shrijit obtained his bachelor's degree in physics from calicut university in kerala and his master's degree in physics from iit madras in chennai afterward he worked as a junior research fellow in the space astronomy group at ur rao satellite center isro bangalore where he contributed to india's first dedicated astronomy satellite astrosat dr shrijit completed his phd in solar physics at the same research group following his phd dr shrijit became a postdoctoral research associate at trinity college university of dublin ireland in 2017 he joined the inter university center for astronomy and astrophysics ayuka in pune as a research associate and currently he serves as an assistant professor at the manipal center for natural sciences mahi starting from 2021 and dr shrijit has also been the project scientist in the team that developed the solar ultraviolet imaging telescope on board the aditya l1 mission since 2018 his research interests include astrophysics solar physics and space science instrument development so this is our great pleasure to welcome dr shrijit padinetri for a, to give a talk in our aip platform but before that i would like to request dr ankit kumar mithal to give a brief introduction on association of indian physicists ankit sir please over to you thank you ma'am uh, is my powerpoint is visible yes yes okay so hello everyone myself dr ankit kumar mittal i am working as as assistant professor in chandigarh university and i am also a finance secretary in association of indian physicists so i welcome you all to this second talk on bip that is what's hot in physics first of all i would like to introduce about our association it is a sub division of js foundation which is registered under mca government of india the main office of aip is in barnala punjab and to achieve efficient outreach to its uh, for to nation we have divided this into six region that is in north south east west central and north east councils so the main objective of the association is to motivate the students as well as teacher researchers of the nation in the field of physics and it further aims to innovates in physics teaching in theory and experiments it also introduces the community to the various physics 
research field and allow them to learn from one other research area. So many talented scholars wish to perform good research, but somewhere they need more facility or guidance. Through this association, we can collaborate and help each other. And further, uh, this platform can be used for a meaningful scientific and academic discussion. So we look forward to scholar faculty member to explore the interdisciplinary research work. These are the list of members with their, their respective positions. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Kumar Singh is a founder member of AIP and uh, Dr. Captain Ritura Singh is a principal coordinator of AIP. Myself, Dr. Ankit Kumar Mittal is a North Journal Chief Counselor and I'm also working as Finance Secretary. And these are the further list as we are short of time, so I'm not reading all the names. So let's uh, talk about WIP, that is what sorted physics. So this public lecture series aimed to bring scientific awareness to the recent and trending topics in physical science. The experts in the field shall be invited to discuss their respective topics. Under the this talk series, the younger generation will understand the patience and efforts made by the scientists to achieve the marvels of physics. It shall also constrain misinformation about scientific advancements and help people understand the importance of such scientific research. So I request all the participants to pay attention to the talk and ask questions during the session or they can put the, their questions in the chat box. Thanks yes. to all. Hand, handing over to Sunali ma'am. Yes, I also request all the participants, you have any questions, please put it in the chat box. We can discuss after the uh, talk is over. Now I request Dr. Srijit to please start this event. Yeah. Okay. Uh... Uh, you, uh, you are sharing the screen? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, is it visible? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, apologies for being a little, little delayed due to technical glitches. Uh, so what I will be doing, I hope these are all uh, physics people, serious physics people. So I have not put this as a very public level. I have talked a little bit physics also in between. So what I would try to do today is then just talking about Aditya L1. If I just talk about the instrument Aditya L1 and the details of the instrument, most of you will get bored because only those who are very much interested in the instrumentation, what are the nitty gritties of the instrument and all will, others will all get bored. So what I would rather do is I'll talk about three things before I go into Aditya L1, the details of Aditya L1 instrument, which is why do we need Aditya L1? First of all, do we need such a satellite to study the sun or a telescope to study the sun? Is it studying the sun important? Second thing is, even if it is important, do we need to go to space to study the sun? Can't we do it from ground? Why do we spend a lot of 600 crore, 500 crore rupees and go to space to study the sun? And the third point is, uh, is uh, about Aditya L1, how, how Aditya L1 is unique uh, in the global scenario. So I'll be mostly covering these through these three agendas in this talk. Uh, we all know that astronomy is the cradle of physics. Uh, this association of physics here. When I say this, some of you may think, is it, is it, isn't it too much claim? But you just imagine for a moment when the human beings were hunter dwellers in the forest, before any civilization established, before agriculture started, we started living as a civilization and all. Much before that, when we were normal hunter dwellers, our ancestors were normal hunter dwellers, they would have noticed the sun rising in the east, very beautiful sun, red color sun coming up. Again, the sun setting in the evening, everything become dark, cold. And this beautiful sky comes up with twinkling things on the sky. And they would have definitely got curious about this, what is happening. And they would have started looking at patterns. They realized that there is almost same time of sunrise and sunset. There is a time gap. 
then they real, they would have noticed the seasons coming sometimes it is become summer sometimes become winter rain coming at some point and they would have also noticed these patterns on the sky the constellations on the sky the stars having particular shape and patterns so definitely where from the time immemorial or when the human beings became curious their brain started thinking become inquisitive asking questions or being curious from that day onwards astronomy would have ignited them to ask questions and wonder what is happening out there and hence i'm saying it's a cradle of physics because of course there is other things also people would have thought about other plants and many other things but definitely astronomy would have been one of those most curious things in the beginning and with with the technology developed people started looking at it through telescopes and people started making other instruments i'm sure you might have aware of many of these old instruments which were used to, to study the astronomy what's happened is the question now is you started studying everything for when i told when we are started studying astronomy for 50000 years or old isn't it completed are you still what what make you ignited or enthusiastic about astronomy even now so this is just an image the image on the left is the image of a region on the sky which you can see from normal eye when you see at night now if you in in last 20 years you know when hubble started taking images of these regions you started seeing a totally different image it's the same region on the sky you can see it's a exactly same region on the sky this all this 10000 50000 years which i talk about history we were thinking it is like this but we started taking photos of those using different filters and all we started seeing all together a new thing so definitely there is much more than what we understood about that region now because there is it looks so many other things are there which need to be explained so even now every day is a new new thing for people studying astronomy that makes astronomy active or beautiful or uh, what do you say the researchers find passion in this even today because you find new new things every day so i was talking in general about astronomy you know uh, we are universe is so big there is 10 thousands of millions of millions of stars out there what we are talking about is a part of this whole universe which is our milky way galaxy and a normal star in our milky way galaxy it's not any special star what we will be talking about is sun which is just one of the star in the whole universe it's one of the average star in the whole universe it's not any special star those who study astronomy knows that there are a lot of excited exciting uh, objects in the universe like black holes you have heard about supernovas and active galactic nuclei uh, x ray binaries there is a lot of interesting things happening in the universe sun is just an average normal star nothing special about sun if you consider the whole universe but i want to impress question is if sun is just a normal star why you want to study that isn't it very visible we know that everything about sun why do we need to study that so my first question i want to address is do we really need to study the sun as galileo galilei told a profound philosophical statement the sun with all the planets revolving around it and depending on it can still ripen a bunch of grapes as if it had nothing else in the universe to do the simple reason why people want to study sun is it's the one which ripen a bunch of grapes in our garden all things on the sun on earth is connected to sun that is why you take any civilization let it be the inca maya civilization let it be the mesopotamian civilization the chinese civilization or the greek or the indian you see sun is a god sun is one of the prime gods so people knew that sun is a very important astronomical celestial body in their life which is influencing their life significantly and hence they started praying to the sun from very very long back so sun was an important celestial body from long back 
Sun is normal star, I told you. It's a middle age star. Nothing interesting. As you know, in our middle age is a boring life. The child or a young age and the old age are exciting. So Sun is a middle age star, nothing special happening there. The stars become interesting when it is born and when it is die, when it is dying. It's a main sequence star. Yeah, you know about, I think some of you might have heard about that. I will not go into the detail. There is something called HR diagram where main sequence star are the normal star, nothing special there. And it's a spectral type G2. But why Sun is important is because Sun is a very special star because it's the only star on which we can resolve special scales, which means you take image of any other star in the universe using the biggest telescopes available in the world, the best camera and the biggest telescope, you still see star as a dot. You cannot see what is on the surface of the star. You cannot see what is happening on the star. So Sun is the only star where you can resolve, you know, word resolve, right? You can see it separately, things happening on the Sun. I'll show you some images of the Sun, which you cannot see from any other star. It's our star, of course, that is why it is very important. All our planets are around that. We are part of solar system. We are directly dependent on that. It provides almost all the energy to the Earth. Little bit, I'm not talking about solar power here. We just think of the energy that we use here, whether it is in a hydroelectric electricity, you need sun to create a climate change here, weather here, rain here, the, the water has to, water vapor has to come up from sea and it has to rain somewhere on the hills, which we make a dam, then produce electricity. You think of any other form of energy, it's all connected to sun some way or other. And our survival, you are walking around, we are eating food, whatever we need to get the energy for our survival, it all comes from sun. The cooking of the food and the plants happen from because of the energy from the sun. So in net net energy, if you calculate, almost all the energy we require comes from the sun. It's also a very special star because it provides us with a unique laboratory in which we can learn many fundamental processes. By which what I mean is there are things which you cannot do in the lab and it happens on the astronomical scales. It will be large scale fusion. Of course, these days we do very small scale fusion in the lab, but astronomical scale events, there are many things which happens on the on the stars, which is not seen generally on the lab. So it's a very unique lab where you can do many unique experiments. For example, helium, discovery of helium happened during a solar eclipse because somebody was observing the sun and they found a new absorption line and that's how helium was discovered. So there are many such fundamental processes which we may not generally see here, but you see in astronomy. So solar physics is connected to almost all many branches of physics. The brief resume of sun is here. I don't want you to go through every detail. It is not easy. Just three few things which to notice is one is it's almost 3.3 lakh the mass of Earth. So imagine the mass of sun is 3.3 lakh. When you say it's, and its size is 100 times Earth radius almost. So when you say something which 100 times and 3.3 lakh massive, you can imagine the density is very high there. And when density is very high, you know the gravitational force it has is much higher. You know the equation GMM by R square and all. So the it's almost lakhs of times gravitational force the sun has over, over the compared to Earth. Uh, it was Galileo Galilei who started systematically studying the sun when he started observing the sun surface using his telescope and started recording the sun on a paper, whatever he saw. And he saw these dark spots on the sun which is moving. He thought it is burned out area on the sun. And he famously told sun, sun god has got pimples, which many people were not happy to agree or it was not well received. How can God have pimples? Pimples are for only human beings. When he told sun god has got pimples, it became very, very unhappy for the people at that time, the feudal lords and the and the church and other people, they became very unhappy about the whole about the statement. 
but he kept on recording this every day and i think from that day onwards we know almost every day sun surface these black dot images galileo did this in 1600s you know galileo lived in 1600s it took almost 300 years it's a beginning of 1900s we really understood what these black dots are at least we know it is now strong magnetic field but still this is a topic of research even i my topic of my phd research was on these things we call sunspots so though it has been observed for this has been observed for 2000 years there is mention of this in uh, in chinese civilizational drawings chinese used to believe it's a crow on the sun there is mention about this in ramayana for example there is mention of black dots on the sun in many 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 places but galileo is a person who started it systematically studying this and even now it's a mystery or it is not fully understood how it is getting formed how it is stable how it is surviving how it is dying how it is changing still not known the size of these black dots is you can see approximately much bigger than size of earth it's not that earth there's earth there i just kept it to show you the comparison of the size from this black dots of galileo as the technology improved we started observing more and more and more things on the sun so you can see the sun which you see will be like this which on the left but with telescope you see many more features on the sun like this hairy structures so many other things and we don't know what's what is the physics of all this what plasma physics is making such structures it's a play between magnetic field and plasma so even the fundamental plasma physics research people there is a lot of things to learn for them from here because how the magnetic field and plasma interact and create such shapes it's not easy to produce these things on earth because first of all the strong magnetic field and the plasma now next question is so you you i think hope you agree that sun is very interesting even today though it is studied for quite long time there are many things which is unknown question is where do we need to go to space to study this can't you study this from from earth sun is so big just go out out outside your house you can see the sun just put a telescope on your terrace you can study it very well you can take nice photographs you have many observatories on ground which is studying the sun for quite long time in india itself our kodaikanal observatory is almost 100 years old why do we need to go to space spending money when it is so bright and available do we really need to go to space to study the sun one of the thing is the atmospheric opacity as you know in this figure on the left side uh, on the y axis is atmospheric opacity on the x axis is wavelength of electromagnetic radiation i think since it's association of physics all of you know about this uh, electromagnetic spectrum or the radiation is having different wavelengths so the visible line what we call the vibgior what we all see that has comparatively the atmospheric opacity of that is comparatively less not zero it's comparatively less that is why the light from the sun or the stars reaches us radio it is almost zero you, atmosphere don't attenuate radio waves at all that is why we use that for all our communication even for mobile phone tv all of that we use as uh, radio waves because reason is atmospheric opacity is less whereas if you go to ultraviolet x ray or even infrared you see that atmospheric opacity is almost 100% means it doesn't allow the light to enter in into our atmosphere at all which means uh, which means it is not allowing it totally blocks you all you would have said it that you we, we are protected from ultraviolet because of ozone etc etc means our atmosphere is totally blocking the radiations like uv x rays etc okay fine is it so we cannot if you want to study the sun in gamma ray or x rays or ultraviolet or even in infrared you have to go to space now question is do we need to study them in this wavelengths can we study the sun only in visible and be happy with it do we really need to study it in uv and all that leads me to this interesting story of uh, 
blind men studying an elephant. You leave this six blind men to study an elephant. They can do whatever experiment they want, like we do in science. So definitely they will go touch, smell. Somebody who will touch the trunk will think elephant is a snake. Somebody who touch the stomach of the elephant will think that elephant is nothing but a wall. Somebody who touch the leg will think that elephant is a tree, etc., etc. If you, as far as they touch only that, they will think it is like that. Now, like when we do in science, suppose we call a conference of these people or a workshop, you call a conference and tell everybody to present their results. That's what we do and try to make a sense out of it. They all will come and argue their case. Somebody will say, no, no, elephant is a wall. Somebody will say elephant is like a tree. Come on, I've touched it so many times and did the measurement, etc., etc. as we all do in science conferences. Now, even if they all agree that, okay, let us make a common figure of a universe, a universal model, which explain all our observations. That's what we do always. The elephant they will make is something like this, which is okay. It's not bad. It's much better than thinking elephant is just a wall or a tree. But still it is not full elephant. The reason is because our observation is limited. They should have studied more. There would have been more observation, more studies. And elephant should have been studied from all perspectives. From all part of the elephant should have been experimented. If you would have put 1 lakh people to touch the elephant, every centimeter square if you touched and reproduced, maybe you'll be more close to the reality. So what I'm trying to say is that astronomy is some field where you cannot experiment. You can only watch through the window and understand what is happening in the laboratory. When you are watching through the window and understanding what is happening in the laboratory, you need to have a large perspective, wide perspective. You need to see it in all perspectives. Only then you will understand it. I will convince you with the real photographs of the sun. This is a real photograph of the sun from last week. I just took it last week when I was preparing the slides. You can see these two sunspots here and few sunspots here. This is the sun what you see from the beach if you go, a beautiful sun. You can also take such photographs. You can see there are sunspots here, which are naked eye objects. You can see there is something here, etc. This is the visible sun we all know for a long time. But again, recently, 20 years back, 90, end of 90s, we sent satellite up there. There was a NASA mission. And they started decided to take the photo of the sun in ultraviolet and X-rays because we already knew that we don't know how the sun is in ultraviolet. So we decided to take photo of the sun in ultraviolet. And you will real, you will see that the sun look really different. This is in one of the ultraviolet line. This is another ultraviolet line called 171. You can see the real photograph, real image of a taken from a satellite called Solar Dynamic Observatory, which was launched in 2010 and in the wavelength 171. You just look, that black dot has become a bright, hairy structure loop structure with a lot of hairy things all around, fibrils are all around. Wherever we saw dark and visible, there is no dark in here, it's all bright. So like the blind man seeing the elephant, somebody who saw the sun in UV will argue that there is nothing called black dots on the sun, it's all bright points on the sun. Whereas a person in visible will argue that no, 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 there is black dots. And you will realize that in, in different wavelengths you see there are more dark features and all it's in another wavelength, it's in very high X-ray emission. You can see there is very bright emission from wherever those sunspots were there. And those fibrous structures have all disappeared. And if you do a magnetic field measurement, which I told you was started in the 1900s only, you'll realize that wherever those brights, wherever those dark spots were there, there is strong magnetic field out there. And that magnetic field is also always bipolar. Bipolar means there is a northward magnetic field and a southward magnetic field. So always it is pair. There is a magnetic field coming out and magnetic field going in. You just compare this. These two region where there is black dots. I think my pointer, I just... So you see this region where there is black two black dots and there is a black dot here. You look here, these two black dots are nothing but magnetic field. One of them is south pole, one of them is north pole. You go here, here also there is strong magnetic field. There is both South Pole, North Pole. 
and also you'll see the same thing. So now we know that these dark spots are nothing but strong magnetic field. Now question is the strong magnetic field is okay. Why is it showing very bright in ultraviolet? Why is it showing very bright in X-rays? As you know, to produce X-ray on a black body radiation, you need very high temperature. From a gas, if you collect a gas or a plasma and leave it in a container, if it has to emit in X-rays, its temperature should be very high. It has to be a million kelvins. Only then certain transitions will happen which will produce X-rays. We see a lot of X-ray emission coming from here, these dark spots, which means there is something that's very hot also. But if it is very hot and visible, you see it as dark, which means it is very cold. So as per visible light study, it is very cold, colder than the colder than the normal sun disk. For example, here it is around 6,000 Kelvin. These dark spots are something like 4,000 Kelvin. But when you study the sun in ultraviolet or X-rays, looks like that region is extremely bright, uh, very hot, like in million Kelvin. So there is something which is missing. These are all very interesting problem. Now we know the reason is this is coming from a bottom layer on the sun, whereas this is coming from a top layer of the sun called corona. Now the question is why corona so hot? Why is it million Kelvin? As you all know, as you go away from the sun, okay, I'll come to this. As you go away from the sun, you are supposed to reduce the temperature because the source is nuclear fusion in the middle. As you go away from the source region, temperature should fall down. But here, at some point, temperature is increasing. I'll come to that. Then we also know there are things like solar flare happen. You would have heard about that in newspapers and all. There is sudden burst of energy and so many particles or big chunk of plasma is thrown out to the space. And I told you in the beginning, the gravitational force of sun is 3 lakh times Earth's, almost, almost a lakh times Earth's gravitation. So imagine the the energy required just to take something out of Earth itself, you know, we need big, big rockets and all. Imagine this big chunk of plasma to be thrown out of sun. How much energy will be required? It's like millions and billions of atomic bomb going off at the same time. Now, that is another question, where all this energy came from? Where is all this energy produced? And to, to create such a big blast. And it happens very often. It's a, again, this is a real videograph. This is what I was saying, you cannot see this on any other star. The only star where you can videograph, record, take image of such spatially resolved things is only on the sun. This is another image which was, which is from uh, 1945 called the Big Daddy eruption. Interesting thing is this happened when Second World War was going on. And they noticed that a lot of flights, their communication with the World War was going on and this aero fighter jets were flying up and down, both Germans and Americans and British. And they noticed that there is a lot of communication disturbances during this big flare. They say if such a flare happened or a prominent eruption happens now, all our satellites up there will get fried off. And such a big one has not happened anytime recently after that. And such big flares, as you know, they all, when it is thrown out of sun's surface, it will come and hit us because it will travel through the sun-earth uh, heliosphere. And when this big chunk of plasma comes and hits us, it creates geomagnetic storm on Earth. You would have heard about this aurora borealis. Even last week, there was nice, beautiful auroras on the higher, higher latitudes. Uh, the atmosphere will look like burning in different colors. Uh, it's called geomagnetic storm. It happens whenever this happens. And as it's geomagnetic storm can disturb many things on the sun earth, from the aeroplane industry to the uh, mining industry, the petroleum industry. So the industry is directly affected by things happening on the sun. That is another reason why there is a lot of interest in solar physics, because if you can predict when exactly this will happen, it will save a lot of money. Sadly, we are still not able to exactly predict when such a big blast on the sun will happen. Even today, we cannot predict exactly when this will happen. There is a lot of interest to study that. And the only way to study that is to go to space, as I told you. You don't see that image which I showed you invisible. All this image which I showed you is in, in ultraviolet. You don't see it invisible. So you have to go to space if you want to see these things. 
Another problem is our atmosphere has atmospheric seeing. Atmosphere will also block the even visible. It won't see properly. So we need to go to space. Another major thing is you can continuously monitor the sun. On Earth, if you have put a telescope in India, you know as it becomes night, you won't miss the sun. You can see the study the sun only from maybe morning seven to evening five, right? So if you want to study it, uh, the sun in full time, continuously. Only way is to go to space. That is the reason why we decided to go to L1 point. So L1 is a Lagrange point between any two body problem. There is five Lagrange points. You take two bodies and a test particle to go, go around that. Uh, I think all of you physics people might be aware of that. It's a two body problem. What we call you take any two gravitational bodies and you put a test particle to go around that. There are five points where the gravitational potential becomes almost null. So there are L1, L2, L3, L4, and L5, where the gravitational potential field becomes minimum or null. So these are the points. If you keep a body here, when you say potential field line, potential field line is a line through which a test particle will travel, right? You have heard about electric potential, magnetic potential lines. Potential field line is a line through which a test particle will keep traveling. The force will apply through that. So it means that if you leave a particle on It means that if you leave a particle here, it will go around the sun. And if you leave a particle here, it will go around the earth. Let's say moon goes around the earth. It's a natural thing. It will go like that. It will just follow these field lines. So if you leave a particle in this L4 point, it will not go anywhere because there is no field line there. It becomes field none. Potential field is not there. It will just stay there. It will not go anywhere. If you keep at L1, unless you are perturbed to these lines outside, Again, it will become null and it will just stay there. It will not go anywhere. And L1 is easy to understand because you can see the gravitational pull towards sun and earth becomes zero. Other points are not difficult to think. You can just do a small computer program and you can model it and you will get the same field line. So those who want to study the sun prefer to go to L1 because you can see the sun continuously. There is nothing in between. There is, of course, Mercury and Venus in between, but that will be look, seen as a very small dots. It won't cause any eclipse or anything. It causes some occultation, that's all. And those who want to study outer sky without disturbance from the sun, they go to L2 point. So they can study the outside universe very nicely. The recent JWST and all has gone to L2 point. This is a photo image of the sun in during eclipse. You can see a beautiful image of the sun in eclipse. You can see all these hairy structures, all this chromosphere, etc. So there is no temperature disturbances at L1. Like if the satellite is at L1, it won't get affected by the temperature. Okay, L1 is no, it won't make any major difference. L1 is just one percent of Sun Earth line. Sun Earth line is around uh, it's just 15 lakh kilometers away, which is just one percent of the one AU. So it, there is no major temperature change. In fact, temperature is more stable here than near Earth because because of the atmosphere and all Earth creates a lot of temperature fluctuation. Here okay. it is, that way it is very stable because it is always seeing the sun on one side. Okay, okay. There is no major fluctuations out there. It is a uniform temperature always. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, this is image of the sun in eclipse. Uh, you, you would have seen, studied, uh, heard about uh, I don't know how many of you have seen an eclipse, full total to to solar eclipse. You can study this outer. I told you the outer side of the sun is very interesting because of its temperature, high temperature. And the only way to study this corona is to block the sun, which you get to see only during eclipses, because otherwise you don't see this. The sun is so bright, it will saturate your eyes or it will saturate your camera or whatever. Naturally, when moon comes, you can see this. People have studied eclipse and they have found very interesting things about eclipse, uh, corona. That is how we knew that corona is very hot because we started seeing certain spectral lines which can be produced only if there is very high temperature. People, when eclipse time, when they started studying the sun, taking spectroscopy of the corona, they found that there are certain, you know, there is spectroscopy, you can calculate temperature using that. And they started finding that temperature is extremely high. That started something called coronal heating problem. Why corona is so hot? 
And the problem is we cannot eclipse in a lifetime. Maybe you can see two or three in one place. Otherwise, it would be an eclipse chaser. You should go behind all the eclipse. Even then, in a lifetime, one person, maybe you can see eight or ten eclipse. That's all. And it is just a few minutes, you know, maybe ten minutes. That's all. And you cannot study the whole thing, science, in ten minutes. As I told you, there is this, this is on the x-axis is the height from sun surface and y-axis is the log temperature, means E power temperature. So you can see at the photosphere, what we see generally, temperature is E power 3 point something, which is around 6000 Kelvin. And as it goes, ideally it should keep on going down because there is no energy production mechanism here. Energy production mechanism happened deep inside in the co core of the sun. But interestingly, instead of temperature going down, it started increasing, it started shooting up to very high temperature called million Kelvin again. You can see it in e power 6 sort of thing. So that leads to that leads to this question that why temperature is 10 power 6 in this corona? What is the mechanism? What is the energetics? Where is the energy for this much heating comes from? These are the photos of different eclipses. You can see that the corona look really different in different eclipse times. In one eclipse, corona look like this, another eclipse looks like this. So what is happening there? That has some streamers, it also has some shape. Only one way to understand this is permanently create an eclipse. Hence, these coronagraphs were defined. Idea is that you make a telescope and close, put an occulter to close the sun disk. This has been tried from ground many times. People have studied corona using coronagraph. But as you see, there is a lot of scatter problem, etc. from ground. The best way is to go to space. And the Aditya was born in 20, 2006 or 7 when I was my PhD days, I have seen early days of my PhD, people were discussing about a simple coronagraph to be fly. So the idea was to fly a simple coronagraph initially. Later, it got developed into many other instruments. There is uh, many other instruments now. There is VLC, suit, uh, no, other instruments, I'll come to this. So this is a real photo of the satellite just before launch. Uh, you can see the suit uh, which I worked on here. This is the coronagraph, the big one. Next to that is ultraviolet imaging. And then there are other instruments in different parts of the part of the satellite. This is the same satellite on the rocket top on the PSLV stage four. Uh, it's a very beautiful view of just before the heat shield closure. You can see some people standing here, so you can compare the size with respect to people here. So this should be, the plan is to place this at L1. This is the orbit we take. As you know, we took few rounds around the Earth and we are almost here at this turning point right now. In fact, next week, end of November, uh, we are going to fall into this this turn and go into this red region and after that. And by January, we will go into this green stable orbit insertion. So we are almost at this L1 point right now already. And uh, in fact, our instrument, our telescope is getting switched on tomorrow. And some of the instruments are already on. And our solar and uh, ultraviolet imaging telescope, which I worked on, uh, I will, we will be switching on tomorrow. I'm, I'm actually today night traveling to Bangalore so that tomorrow we can switch on our uh, telescope for the first time after launch. So there are seven instruments on Aditya. One is the visible emission line coronagraph. There is ultraviolet imaging telescope. Then there are two X-ray instruments. As I told you, UV and X-ray has become very important to study. And then there are three in-situ measurements. In-situ measurement means these three things will measure the plasma properties at L1 point. These four will study the sun in a remote sensing way. Standing at L1, we look to the sun and study the sun. Whereas these three things will measure the properties at L1 point. So we'll study the solar wind particles at L1, the plasma properties at L1 using PAPA, and the magnetic field measurements at L1 using a magnetometer. This is a detailed image of that, as I told you, model of that. This is VLC suit, and there is a high energy X-ray instrument here. There is some soft X-ray instrument here. And this is a magnetometer boom. It will get extended after it reaches L1 and et cetera, et cetera. 
So this is from Soho. Soho is one instrument on on which was launched by NASA in 20, uh, 1998, uh, 96 basically, but 98 it started operating. You see coronagraph, uh, you see nice images on this. So you may ask this question that if Soho has studied this already, why do we need a coronagraph now? You just look at this. This is Lasco C2, which is a coronagraph made by NASA. This is another coronagraph made by NASA and flown on thing, but it only operated for a few years, two years, then it died. This is a ground-based coronagraph, and this is an eclipse photo. You see the difference? Can you just look at this four and see how nice eclipse photo is compared with the other coronagraph? So the technology is limited. The moon created corona is much beautiful, much better because of some scatter, etc. We are still nowhere close to making a corona like what we see during eclipse. So always this technology has to improve. So we are going to, ELC will be looking at these images again. Uh, in a much more close to the sun, almost very close to the sun, it will go and study the properties. Because you see Lasco C2, which has been operating for some time, it is seeing only from 2.5 solar radius onwards only. It is not seeing what is happening inside. So VLC will be looking at this region, this is an eclipse photo. It also will be doing some spectroscopy. You know, spectroscopy is very important to understand the physics. And it also has some logometric properties in this region. The major goal of VLC is to study the corona and dynamics of things happening on the corona. I will not go to the detail unless somebody is very much interested in this because it is more specific and may not be interesting to a general audience. Then this is an instrument I personally worked on as a project scientist for the last five, six years. This is an ultraviolet imaging telescope. So you can see there is a there are, there is a there is a big mirror here. It's a 14 centimeter mirror, dia. And then there is a secondary mirror, and then we capture the image here. It passes through some filter wheels, etc., for choosing specific spectral bandwidth. It's a very unique instrument. It provides near simultaneous images in NUV, near UV, which is 200 to 400 range, which is not well studied before. Uh, it's very unique in the world, actually, because nobody has studied this region in before. Even earlier, NASA mission, as I told you, this temperature is increasing. This is called Photosphere, chromosphere, this is the region. Chromosphere is the region where they start increasing. So we will be studying this region. Uh, this is sun in different images as I already showed you. This region is very little studied, limited observation. So we will be studying this region mostly. And one important thing is that this ultraviolet range which we are studying, 200 to 400. When, when we say that our atmosphere is blocking the ultraviolet, it also means that all that energy of the ultraviolet get deposited onto the atmosphere, right? So when we say all this atmospheric, all this energy get deposited onto the atmosphere, what happened to that energy? We all know that energy has to be conserved. So there is some conservation of energy. So when our atmosphere absorbed that ultraviolet rays coming from the sun, it that energy does something in our atmosphere. It may be making some changes in our atmosphere, it may be doing chemical changes, some reactions, it may be doing something. So there is a lot of interest to study that. A lot of people are studying the stratospheric heating, etc. because of this. And for that people, they need to know how much UV comes from the sun, etc. etc. So soot will be one of the unique instruments to give you that information that how much this energy comes from the sun, etc. Okay, uh, this is again the same image. Uh, this is the actual photo of the suit. Uh, since it is very, very sensitive to contamination, you can see that if you want to do any work on this, you need to work like an operation theater because ultraviolet is very, very sensitive to contamination. You cannot enter the lab without all this, all these gears, which you can see here in this photo. Okay, this is me working on the telescope. So suit, what VLC will see this region, the corona, and suit will see this disk. So combined suit and VLC will cover the whole cell. That is the idea. Okay. Uh, our science goals basically solar flare studies, all these prominent studies. I already covered most of them. So I don't want to go to the details. Then there is also X-ray emission. I told you solar flare, there is a sudden X-ray emission, almost 10 power 6 times energy comes suddenly from the sun. So there is very lot of interest to study sun in X-rays. Uh, uh, okay. Let me not go to those in detail. So 
there is two x-ray payloads. I'm not going to the details of that because my time is very limited. We started already late. But if anybody is interested, we can go through that. Uh, just wanted to say that there are two instruments which cover 1 keV to 150 keV. You can see I have marked here. One is in blue color, which is soft x-ray payload. And there is a hard x-ray payload, which is uh, the, uh, the larger x-ray, high energy x-rays. Basically, all these X-rays will study the solar flares and the abundance on the, on the sun, corona, etc. And this was the scenario. This is the energy versus resolution. We were missing this particular region, and Helios suit will Solex will cover basically this region, which was not there in the earlier observation. What I'm trying to say is a very simple thing that we are unique in globally, and hence the global community has a lot of interest in uh, these instruments because it's not a repetition of what is happening on other part of the world. Then there are in-situ instruments to study the plasma properties as well as magnetometer things. Okay, I'll summarize so that I finish in 40 minutes time. Uh, there are a lot of uh, unanswered questions in solar physics and Aditya is going to produce lots of data to study this. If you take our telescope alone, suit alone, we are producing almost <coughs> almost 15 GB of data every day. Almost 10,000 images of the sun every day we'll be taking. So our team with some 30, 20 people cannot study 10,000 images a day. So it is open, it is important or it's the right time for the larger physics community. If anybody is interested to study these things on the sun, etc., this is the right time to start working on this. A lot of data is there, our own instruments, our own data is, will be available in coming months, especially from maybe next January, February onwards. And uh, there are a lot of avenues and opportunities being provided by ISRO as well as there is Aditya support cell, which is training people on how to use this data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Even students or even faculties in colleges, universities, if they want to put their students into some project on Aditya L1, there is a lot of opportunities right now available and this is the right time to enter into that field. We need lots of people, thousands of people to work on this. Only then we can make sense of this data and do some interesting science. Okay, I will end here with a uh, movie. Uh, meanwhile, you can ask your questions or put the questions in chat box or whatever as per the as per your coordinators thing. I'll just play this movie. It's a movie, a real movie of a failed flare on the sun. You can see how beautiful it is. Uh, there was a solar flare happened, you know, if it don't have enough energy to push everything out, it will fall back. And when it falls back, it falls back very interestingly. It's called coronal rain. It's like plasma falling back to the hot plasma falling back to the sun but it falls in a very nice or in a particular track okay i leave with you with this meanwhile i'll just go through the questions yes thank you thank you so much Nakashiji, for such a great informative talk yeah i had a one question that as it is a very long journey so how many maneuvers it took Aditya took to reach the Lagrange or uh, I had just shown one uh, curve the trajectory. Here. I, think, uh, I had just shown one thing I'll just show you once this movie is over uh, yes, there, yes. Is, uh, there is uh, around five uh, maneuvers around earth and oh. then uh, then it kept on traveling towards the L1 point and there is one maneuver coming up in November 28th to capture the L1 region and there is another one coming up in uh, January 5th or 6th uh, to, to enter into the stable orbit uh, around L1. Okay. okay. Yeah. So I have a question. So Yes, yes, definitely. Everyone are open to ask the questions. Yes, uh, hello, sir. It's a wonderful talk, and thank you so much. 
all this insightful talk and i have learned a lot so uh, my doubt is like uh, okay so like l1 point or all the like the points potential field zero but what about the solar flares they can come and they can harm the our, our observatory so what's your yes. comment on that yeah, yeah there is definitely a plasma pressure as well as a radiation pressure when this huge radiation comes even the radiation which is falling on the solar panel will add a small push to the satellite and when this flare or big plasma bunch comes that also will push the satellite a little sideways okay. for that we do we need to do some correction at some point that is why we carry some fuel and uh, smaller corrections will be okay because it will be done and but uh, satellite carry some momentum wheels and there is some technology once in a while some correction station keeping will be required. Okay. It is much better than not like Earth where we need to do regularly. Okay. Here, once in a while, we need to do because of this, this pressures and all. Uh, okay. So now there is technology to also fix, fix that. Yeah, yeah. And, okay, thank you. Technology is basically just, just firing things like rocket on the satellite. There are many such small, small, small rocket like thing. You fire it in the distant direction you want and it can Put a pressure and poke force in that direction. Okay. So would this study also help us to estimate the lifetime of the of solar our sun? Like how long it will take to turn into white dwarf or any other stars? No, no, that is a very, very long thing because sun is still 4.5 giga year away, which is crores of away. And that is mostly based on models and all. Don't really some of these models are verified, but uh this satellite there is no specific that is very 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 broad number okay okay the error bar on that is like okay. lakhs of years <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I get this. yeah but because depending on the channel second limit like uh so i have to say that it will turn into white dwarf or mostly white dwarf i, I guess so but okay so it is a long journey yeah yeah it's long journey so, I guess there are some questions in the chat box. Nali, you can. Yes, yes. There's a question by Yash. So, he is asking uh, Sun is a star and always shine, which means it's infinite. it has infinite energy in the Sun. So, is there infinite energy in the Sun? Okay. So, yeah, yeah. it's a very interesting question. It is definitely not infinite energy. That is why just now Captain was talking about at some point all this will burn out that time is a question after 4.5 giga years all this energy will be burned out all this conversion of hydrogen to helium helium to carbon everything will be over and that is when the star die any star so it is not infinite energy it is definitely finite energy based on the mass of the star and after some point it will die and that's why all this you talk about black holes or white dwarf or supernova explosions happen during death etc in fact in fact we are also part of dead stars sun was born out of a dead star definitely reason is because we see iron i didn't spend talk about that much we see iron on the sun we see iron on earth we dig iron from earth we have iron in our blood right we go for uh, people say you have iron deficiency you take iron tablets people say right mm -hmm. iron can be produced only when a dead star die you cannot create iron in the universe unless there is a star death happening you it's a basic basic physics you study nuclear physics i am 26 there's a curve thing it is even if with whatever fusion it do you add hydrogen helium helium carbon you cannot create iron by fusion to create iron you need a huge pressure as well which happens only during supernova explosions and such things if you see iron which means it is star has died so if we have blood in our Iron is there in our blood means we were all part of a dead star, but up some time. That's why Carl Sagan famously told we are star dust. Definitely, we all came from some star at some point. Okay. Oh, that, that's very interesting, actually. I <laughs> never thought that the sun came from a dying star. I thought there may be some uh, nebula or yeah, nebula yeah. sun formation happened. So, okay, so, but this is the north case with sun, right? That's what it's saying. Yeah, like, sun was formed out of some dead star nebula, definitely. Okay, or, sir. Okay. Yeah. So when the supernova explosion happened, the remaining gas hang around and it forms a new nebula okay. and new stars are born always, right? Out of that yeah, nebula. Yeah, that so nebula. So this one's a secondary or tertiary or mm -hmm. later level star. Okay. 
Okay. Because you see high elements there, high, high. Yeah, heavier elements, yeah. Heavier elements there, yeah. So as far as my knowledge is there, water is present in the sun. So that part of research is also going. You cannot it. call it. See, when depends on what you call water. Okay. OH ions are there definitely on sun. Uh, water is in H2O. It may not be in H2O format, but OH molecules are available everywhere. Not okay. only on the sun, even on the planets and like uh, people have seen in Mars, Moon and all. Whether it is in the forma of a H2O or not is not known, but I don't think sun has H2O format, but OH ions are there. Okay. So there are another question, Radhika. So and plus, the temperature of the sun is so high, you cannot survive a H2O yes, format. Yes, H2O cannot survive. Yeah. Okay, so what are supernovas and how are they affecting us? No, supernovas won't affect us other than our mind. Because uh, it's very interesting to it will affect your mind. It may give you sleepless nights if you study about supernova because it's such a beautiful things how star die with such explosions and all. But other than that, there is no direct effect to us unless a supernova explains somewhere nearby, uh, which we don't know. Some Milky Way galaxy, some star becomes a supernova. It may not affect us again, but you may see it is very bright on the sky, like a sun. Last few days, then supernova happens nearby. Otherwise, uh, I don't think there is any danger of affecting us directly uh, in near future. As far as we learn, as far as we know. Of course, astronomy is a field where people come to know new things every day. So, Okay, so there is another question. Could you explain L1 point, sir, in detail? Why potential is zero there? Okay, this is, uh, I showed that. So if you are a physics student or a physics teacher or a computer science student or engineering student, you can simply use gravitational equations, GMM by R square and centripetal force in a test body moving around. There is a centripetal force outward. And you can write a code to calculate gravitational field everywhere from sun to earth. You write a code. It's a very simple thing to do, a modeling, not very difficult. You will realize that at this point, this force and this force will cancel out. And there is zero force here. Similarly, there are points at L2 where the centripetal force of the object will be so much that it will balance both sun and earth. And it will go in a in a in a your field line will not be there. And L5 also and L4 also, you'll see that because of the particular nature, sun is pulling towards here, so earth is pulling towards here. So there's a net force becomes zero at these points. So it can be calculated, it's not a very big complicated thing. It is there for any two-body problem between sun and earth and moon also. You take moon and earth, there will be some points where L1, L2, L3, L4 in that. The place where moon will pull towards and sun will, earth will pull. Near to moon, there will be a point where gravity becomes zero, right? So it is there for any gravitational two-body problem. So uh, it is a well-known thing. It is nothing, nothing. You can do a calculation and find that out. Okay, okay. This is what uh, that uh, Sonali was asking in the beginning, the number of maneuvers we did. So yes, we have four maneuvers, and the fifth one is happening here. Then. So yes, so is this is a, such a long journey? So it's uh, scary of getting solar flares and any. That's okay. Yeah, yeah, we have taken care of radiation effects and all. All the satellites which goes abroad, we make sure the electronics is radiation hardened. It will not. Survive, it will survive the radiation. All those things are taken care. Okay, so this is the first observatory to the space for the sun. But, no, no. There are many observatories on the space. To the L1 point, this okay. is the not even first also. I told you Soho, which was launched by Saturn, uh, NASA, yes. was also in the L1. And this is the second observatory that way to study the sun. To study the in situ points, like the things happening on L1, there are some like solar wind and all. There are other two, three. There is an ACE, there is a Discover. So there are three, four satellites in L1 already. So Ho is not working right now, but okay. it was also placed in this place. Okay, so we are getting a lot of questions. So I hope it's okay for you. So if you have any, oh, sure, sure, sure. It's... So we can we predict the life of Sun? See, these are all stellar mo things. Are stellar models are? It's based on see what we do in science astronomy is 
since we cannot experiment, we cannot go to the lab and tune our parameters, right? You're far away, you just peep through the window. It's like somebody close, put you inside a lab, close all the doors and windows and do that, you do the experiment. And tell somebody else that you will peep through the window and find out what is happening there. We are in that situation. We can only peep through the window and find out what is happening out there. So what we do is that people make mathematical models on how is a star born and all. Based on mathematical model, they will say that if this is true, you see this, 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 you can observe. And based on that, we observe and then we correct the mathematical model, observe correct mathematical model. So it's observation theory thing. Based on such multiple corrections and all, we have come to a conclusion that uh, sun has so much plasma and so much fusion reaction rate is happening. If this rate is happening, it will survive for another almost 4 giga year. It is a model based, but model is verified through observations of neutrino and such things happening coming from there. It's not a blind number, it is a corrected model sort of thing. Okay. So, I, and, uh, I yes, have yes. One other question. so first of all, I have comments on the solar, this uh, supernova question. So I think, yeah, so our sun is our pro 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 protector. So its magnetic field, I think, also uh, protecting us from those, uh, any uh, outer space uh, radiation, like cosmic rays coming. So hmm. correct me if I'm wrong. Correct, so, correct. Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah. So uh, sir, my one question is, uh, what is about the solar year? So like uh, uh, one after 10 or 11 in the solar year. So why it is happening? Solar cycle, yeah. Yeah, why it is happening and what is so special about it? Yeah, yeah. so solar cycle is basically means, uh, I didn't go to those details because sun itself is a topic I can talk for many hours. <laughs> yeah. uh, so we have a cycle of solar magnetic field. I yeah. showed you somewhere the magnetic field uh, on the sun, yeah. all those uh, sunspots yeah. on the sun. Yeah, uh, sure. This sunspots, there is a cycle on this number of sunspots appearing on the sun. It is because of some dynamo process inside. You can see the sunspots here. Yes, this yes. has a cycle. It will increase its number and then reduce the number, increase the number, reduce the number. Approximately around 11 years is a cycle uh, on average. That is also a lot of study. There is a lot of groups studying that why this 11 year yeah, yeah, is exactly right. happening, whether we can model it correctly, etc. Et right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so there is a topic of research, I guess. That is itself is a topic of research, the whole field of research. <laughs> so for students here present here, I would like to ask that uh, what are the opportunities, like what are the subjects for an MSc student to take to study a solar physics? So as I told you, know, solar physics in one slide I showed you, it is connected to almost every lot of, means many other fields of science. But if there are MSc students interested to study the sun, you have this is the right time opportunity to study because there is a lot of enthusiasm because of all these observations and all. So you can solar physics is connected to everything. People studying cosmic rays, local interstellar medium, people studying about planets, extrasolar planets, atmosphere thing. People generally talking about cool stars, neutrino gravitation studies, atomic molecular physics people, plasma physics. So sun earth connections or sun planet connections. How the climate and space weather affects because of sun. Apart from studying the sun, it's also connected to many other branches of science. So students, I think this is the right time. And plus, there is a drive right now to bring more people to solar physics because uh, we need people to use all these data. This is a national taxpayers' money, all this. So it, everybody should be able to use this and do things. So there is a lot of Unlike normal time, there are people ready to come and conduct workshops in your place. There are people ready to come and teach you and tell you how to analyze this data, how to make deductions, etc. Et there is actually a ISRO has set up a particular cell. It's all itself in Aries, Nainital. Uh, you, you would have heard about Aries, yeah, Saribata yeah. Observatory in Nainital, Uttarakhand. They have set up a specific cell only for this purpose of training people on using Aditya data. So if you can contact them, you can Google search and you can contact them. They will they go around conducting workshops every three months in different colleges, universities, so that students can learn how to use these data, etc. Okay, okay. So and are there any future coming uh, satellites or launching from for the sun from ISRO? Uh, no, sun discussions are there. What next to do? In, because you know this takes ten years to make the satellite. Yes. If you want to make another launch, another one in 2035, we need to discuss now. 
there are some discussions on what we need to do next etc uh, but isro has other scientific missions also in december there is a launch of it's uh, one exposat which is basically to study the x ray polarimetry polarized x rays from stars uh, so uh, looking at different stars and other exotic objects and to study how is the x ray polarized basically to study the magnetic properties etc other things uh, that is getting launched in uh, i think this december or january it will get launched and there are other missions there are discussions about venus mission there is discussions about uh, going back to moon again etc etc okay okay so are there any questions so uh, i guess uh, you missed one question in the chat box uh, it was okay. related to the time scale uh, i guess yash has asked that uh, he says because the gravity is different at point l1 and at earth so is there any difference in time scale what time scale is it uh, so according to relativity there is a, a role of uh, what we can say gravity affects the oh. time Yes. No, no, this is yeah, yeah. I don't think Earth's gravity and all affects that much. You need extreme high gravity uh, for general relativity to kick in. There may be minute corrections. Definitely, it will be there. It's not that zero or anything, uh, but it's not significant. There will be some some time delay and all. That's all. Yeah, you need black hole for this, I guess. Black hole will turn start to. Yeah, this is earth is not that that very heavy gravitation to change the time yeah. okay so if there are any uh, no questions really sir it's a great honor to have you and give your precious time to us uh, we are really really glad to have you here and uh, thank you so much again thank you very much uh, it was really a very insightful talk and i request yugen sir to please conclude with the vote thanks uh, thank you sonali ma'am uh, first of all i would like to thank uh, sri srijit sir because he has wonderfully uh, explained us various things like uh, how from ast how astronomy started and why we need to study Star, uh, the sun, despite it is an ordinary star, uh, and why to go outside the Earth, uh, and all the technical details of Aditya L1 and interesting facts about that, and at the last, the beautiful answers to all the curious questions. So, uh, once again, I thank. Uh, also, I thank uh, Dr. Sanjay sir, Captain sir, Sonali ma'am, and Ankit sir for their active participations. And all the members of AIP. This could not happen successful because without the participants. So I thank all because of their interaction uh, through questions and active listening. Uh, this uh, lecture has become successful, and I thank one and all. And I declare that this session is over. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so actually, before that. And even everyone, please sit on your camera. So we have a culture of traditional taking the uh, screenshots. And we will release at least one group photo. So please, everybody are requested, please switch on your camera. So this, the activities has always been online, the association activities. So we have always taken the group pictures here. Thank you, Sarji, sir, for explaining in such a nice way. We really look forward again to hear another. Yes, sure. If we organize some, any uh, offline event, that would be better. So, like, we can yes. interact more. So, it yes. was so interaction was limited. But, uh, yeah, next time we will try to uh, organize one offline event. So, that would be better. Yes. Yeah, thank you for hosting me. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, I have, I have taken the pictures. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. You ended up the recording?